Are you learning or maybe thinking about learning Debussy's beautiful Claire de Lune? Well, if so, stay tuned for some ideas that you can incorporate into your piano practice. Are you sitting comfortably? Then let's begin. Hi, this is Tommy with Tommy's Piano Corner. The place for returning pianists, or indeed anybody who loves a piano, to share tips and ideas of how to get the best from this great hobby. If this is your first trip here, then please don't forget to subscribe, just click on the little icon in the bottom right hand corner of your screen and it's all done for you. Claire de Lune is one of those iconic pieces that I think many of us attempt to learn before we're really technically ready for it. The beginning and the end sound deceptively very simple, yet the middle section gets quite tricky and it can be quite hard to control sometimes. It might take a long time before we're really able to play this piece end to end without making too many mistakes, yet we can still play it very beautifully by paying a little more attention to those simpler sections and making them sing all the more. This is a fairly slow piece of music on the whole, and it only really gets faster as we get into the middle section. But, you know, let's spend a few moments to consider just how fast or slow in fact we would ever need to play this piece. You might be surprised to know that the great pianists all have very different ideas about how fast or slowly to interpret this piece. I did that exercise I described in one of my earlier videos where I effectively split the piece into sections and then timed those different sections as they're played by different pianists. Here are the results that I got. As you can see, there are fairly big differences in tempo choice here. If you take the very fastest section, you can see that Richter actually plays this 25% slower than either Sion Jin Cho or Hélène Grimaud. Or indeed myself, actually, when I time myself doing it. So, if you're a little worried about how fast or slow to play this piece, what I'd recommend you do is wait until you've got it reasonably under control, then do the same exercise. Time your favourite pianist playing the different sections and then time yourself and see how you get on. You'll then be able to make adjustments to this as you hear from the recordings that you've got. And also, you might be surprised to find that you don't need to be able to play it anything like as fast as you originally thought might be the case. Getting the obvious out of the way first, I guess, is the key signature. D flat major, lots of flats, that can put a lot of people off, but to be honest, once you've managed to get used to it, it fits really, really well under your hands and it's nice and easy to play on the whole in this key signature. Then probably the first thing of note is the use of the unicorder pedal. So this is the left hand pedal. Now, the dynamic here is pianissimo, but I don't believe that you need to use the unicorder pedal to actually control the dynamic. That, for me anyway, is not really the purpose of that pedal. If you're not familiar with how it works, if you're playing on a grand piano, then what it actually does is it shifts the entire action ever so slightly over to the right, so that when the hammers hit the strings, at the top end of the piano where you have three strings per note, the hammer will only hit one of the three strings, hence the una, one, corda, string. Of course, on an upright piano, what you'll find is that it works in a completely different way. All it really does is moves the hammers slightly closer to the strings than they originally were, so that when you play, the sound is softer. And that's why, generally, this pedal gets nicknamed the soft pedal. Therefore, if you're practicing on an upright piano, then definitely don't use this left pedal while you're practicing this piece. Don't use it as a way of controlling the dynamic. Practice the getting the pianissimo just by using your fingers. If you're lucky enough to practice on a grand piano, then you can use the unicorder pedal because it, it makes a difference to the sound. And that difference is quite beautiful, but again, 
it does you no harm to practice without it so that you don't rely on the pedal itself to help with the dynamic. If you're practicing on a digital piano, then generally these have got samples that were recorded using the unicorder pedal on a grand piano. And so it does give you some degree of the change in timbre that you will get on a grand piano itself. When you're practicing, I'd say don't use it particularly on a digital piano, but when you perform, why not? If you're happy that it produces a nice sound, then it's fine to use. Next, despite the apparent simplicity of the first section, you'd be surprised that in many enthusiastic amateur recordings, let's say, that it's not always played as well as it might be. And I suspect this is because people have spent most of their time focusing on the trickier parts, thinking that the simpler parts don't need as much attention. First, of course, it's marked pianissimo, which in itself is quite difficult to achieve in a controlled manner. And then, of course, there are many chords in this section, and these chords need to be played so that they sound beautifully together and not spread. And of course, there is a melody here, and that melody needs to be very, very carefully voiced. And because the speed is actually quite slow and the dynamic is so quiet, if you miss voicing one or two of the notes of the melody, it's very easy for it to get lost completely. In reality, naturally, you're more likely to be voicing the melody, perhaps piano or maybe even mezzo piano rather than pianissimo, but nonetheless, you need to keep the remainder of the notes beautifully light so that the overall pianissimo dynamic can be maintained. I'd recommend that as you start practicing this particular section, get yourself into the habit of recording it very regularly so that you can hear whether or not you're voicing the notes exactly as you think you are. Because sometimes when we're playing, we don't always hear properly as well as a recording will let us hear. This next section then starts again at the pianissimo dynamic, at least initially. So given that the right hand is playing octave chords, it's quite important to ensure that your pinky is voiced nicely. However, I made a discovery about this when I was looking at the music one day and I noticed that if you watch the left hand carefully, then pretty much for this entire section right up until the broken chords at the end, the bottom note of the left hand is exactly the same as the top note in the right hand. And therefore, it to me it makes beautiful sense to try and voice the bottom note of the left hand as well as the pinky of the right hand so you get this effect of the melody being duplicated two octaves apart. I find that when I manage to pull this off successfully, it adds a wonderful depth to this entire section. Now for what I think is probably the most difficult part of this piece, and that's the middle section. Now this section, I always think of it as being split into three distinct parts. You've got the first part, which is in D flat major. It then moves into E major, where it gets a little quicker. And then you've got that calmato marking where it comes back to five flats again. As you can see from the score, it starts with un poco mosso, which means a little faster, a little more movement. It then goes to on animo, which I interpret as meaning, you know, even more animated again, before finally calming down towards the end with the calmato marking. And I think there are two major challenges with this section. The first of these is that there are three left-hand arpeggiated figures which are quite difficult to pull off well. For the D-flat major arpeggiated figure in your left hand, I find the first thing to concentrate here on really is finding a good fingering that fits your hand and then make your choice about how you're going to move when you play this. Personally, I don't try to keep any kind of legato movement in my left hand here, as the whole arpeggio is pretty much caught in the pedal anyway. And then to practice it, I basically used a different variety of rhythms such as these.
The next arpeggiated figure is an F sharp minor seven figure in the left hand again. And this too needs a fairly good amount of hand separate practice to get it under control. The same principle of rhythms and what have you applies here, so you can practice like this. And the final arpeggiated figure is the A flat major figure in the left hand again. Now this follows the same pattern in that you need to make sure you've got a good choice of finger in here. And the analogy that sort of came to my mind when I first started looking at this was your hands a little bit like a crab as it moves up and down the keyboard. So you open and close your hand as you move up and down. The second major difficulty for me anyway in this section is the way the accompaniment passes from the left hand to the right hand here in a number of places. To be able to get this smooth without any jerkiness as, uh, as it passes from hand to hand takes a lot of work. And again, I ended up doing quite a lot of rhythmic practice with this as well to just try and get it smooth. Now you might find certain bits of this more challenging than others. I certainly found that the E major section here was quite hard to do because of the way the left hand and the right hand interact together. So I found it useful to do some practice by creating what you might call a skeleton of it and focusing on where the thumbs actually coincide when playing. So something like this. I think then probably the final thing to note about this section is that Debussy throws us a couple of very beautiful curveballs here where he actually introduces a, I don't know, I guess you'd call it a tenor voice to complement the melody in a number of places. Now whilst this is nothing like as complicated or as difficult as a, say, Bach counterpoint, it's certainly still something that needs quite a lot of detailed work. And again, this is where recording yourself is really going to help. So you can listen properly to how everything's voiced and whether things do sound as clear as you expect. We then have the final section, of course, which is basically very similar to the original theme. However, it's an octave higher here and it has a different accompaniment to it. Look carefully at the score and you'll notice tenuto markings on the bass notes of the left hand. And I find that when you play this properly, it gives a sort of sound of beautifully chiming bells just underneath it, which makes a wonderful addition. What's also worth noting is the C flat in bar 59. Again, here you'll notice that Debussy has marked this with an accent because he wants you to really bring this new change in harmony out as you play. Finally, from bar 66, we're sort of winding down to the end. And this has that same idea of the rising arpeggios passing from one hand to another. And it's even more important here to pay particular attention to the evenness of them because now there's no melody notes or anything else to distract the ear, so any unevenness becomes very apparent. Again, something that merits putting in a lot of detailed extra work. I hope you'll find these suggestions helpful as you work through this piece. I firmly believe that if you can bring out more of the beauty of these simpler sections, then the odd wrong note in the complicated parts can easily be forgiven. After all, Beethoven himself said that to play a wrong note is insignificant, but to play without passion is inexcusable. Another of my favourite pianists, Vladimir Horowitz, had his own views about wrong notes. He basically said, Always there should be a little mistake here and there. I'm for it. The people who don't do mistakes are cold like ice. 
It takes risk to make a mistake. If you don't take risk, you are boring. Don't forget to subscribe to Tommy's Piano Corner. Click on that little bell icon so you're notified of all new videos as and when they're released. I thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next week.